It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael. I am your host this morning. Um, we're in our third uh, segment of four. Today is Tuesday, the 22nd, and uh, we're going to talk about a, a uh, an issue which I think is very important for us to, uh, to be aware of. There was an article, you know, for the most part, most Americans don't realize how far down the rabbit hole we've fallen in terms of our debt scenario and where we stand on that issue. And... I think a lot of Americans don't realize that in this last shutdown and the the, the uh, debt discussions that we had, the House made a couple of serious blunders, and they weren't mistaken blunders. They were willful. One of them is that they changed the way in which debt, the debt limit can be raised in the country. How they did it is they gave the power of the purse – a constitutionally uh, mandated authority from the House to the executive. Now, I called on a a previous show for some constitutional attorneys to take a look at this because I don't even think the House has the authority to do that. But to make matters worse, the way it works is this. Normally, the president asks for, for you know, proposes a new amount to borrow when the debt limit comes up. And then Congress goes back and, and, you know, addresses it and they discuss the spending and so forth and so on. And then they come back and they decide what they're going to do, how much can actually be borrowed and so forth. They put a cap on it and that runs for basically a year. Then they go back and, you know, every year they go back and, and visit this over and over and over again. The way that now Congress has to vote on it and approve it, and then they send it to the president, and the president can either veto that or he can sign the bill and then borrow the money. They've changed the approval process. And here's what they did. The president going forward will now declare the amount he is going to borrow, and it is up to Congress to override him by a two-thirds majority vote in order to keep him from spending that amount of money. Now, there's two problems with that. First and foremost, it takes a two-thirds majority of the House and the Senate to pass a constitutional amendment, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, in this political climate, a two-thirds majority of both the House and the Senate is virtually impossible to achieve, and they both know it. And so by giving the president the power to set a new debt limit and forcing Congress to override the president, they have, for all intents and purposes, and mark these words carefully, they have treasonously, treasonously given away the power of the purse, a constitutionally mandated authority for, uh, to the House, to the executive now. The, the executive has been, man, has, been, has been annexing power for the past 50, 50 or so years. And this is an area that is so critical to the survival of the nation. I don't think you realize the, the, the danger level associated with giving the president a blank check that you now have to override in order to prohibit its use. Representative Tom McClintock. He is from the 4th District of, Repu- of uh, California. He's a Republican. And I'm going to read this to you real quickly. He made a couple of very, very startling comments on here. This is a speech that lasts about four minutes. I'm going to play it for you. It's actually five minutes. I apologize. But we have the time this morning, and I want you to hear it. 
if you can't if, and if you're if you're listening on the air or you're listening on radio or you're catching it on our on our streaming video links that's fine if not you know you can you can find it on our website on our facebook page and on our youtube page Here's what he has to say. The debt limit exists for a simple reason, to assure that public debt isn't recklessly piled up without Congress periodically acknowledging it and addressing the spending patterns that are causing it. If a debt limit increase is supposed to be automatic, as the president suggests, there really is no purpose to a debt limit. The new, a new dimension has appeared in this discussion. Unlike every one of his predecessors, this president has vowed that unless Congress unconditionally raises the debt limit, the United States will default on its sovereign debt. This guy gets right to the heart of this. I love the way he, he approaches this. A failure to raise the debt limit would not by itself cause the nation to default. The Government Accountability Office has consistently held that the Treasury Secretary has the authority to choose the order in which to pay obligations of the United States to protect the nation's credit. This authority is inherent in the 1789 Act that established the Treasury and entrusted it with the management of the revenue and the support of the public credit. The affirmative duty of the Treasury Department to do so is underscored by the 14th Amendment. Our revenues are more than 10 times our debt payments, so paying the debt first to prevent a sovereign default is well within the financial, financial ability of the federal government, and indeed it is a fiscal imperative. Earlier this year, the House passed H.R. 807, which not only explicitly requires the payment of the national debt in the event of an impasse over the debt limit, but it even allows the president to exceed the debt limit itself in order to protect the nation's credit. That measure languishes in the Senate under the threat of a presidential veto. Protecting the sovereign credit by prioritizing payment would mean delaying paying other bills, which is untenable, unthinkable, and something much to be avoided. But it would not imperil the nation's sovereign credit. Only the president can do that. House leadership met with the president last week and offered to extend the federal debt limit until November 22 with no strings attached. The president refused. Senate Republicans offered a six-month extension. Senate Democrat leader refused. That's Harry Reid. What the president threatens to do would be catastrophic and unprecedented. The full faith and credit of the United States is what gives the market the confidence to loan money to the federal government. Even a credible threat of default exactly the kind the president is now making, could have dire consequences to a nation that now owes more than its entire economy produces in a year. So where do we go from here? Republicans have miscalculated on two key assumptions. He's very accurate here. Listen to this and mark these words. This is why you're, where your critical thinking skills come into play, folks. Republicans have miscalculated on two key assumptions. First, that the Democrats would negotiate the issues that divide the country. They have not. Second, the Democrats would seek to minimize the suffering caused by the impasse. They have not. Given the ruthless and vindictive way the shutdown has been handled, I now believe that this president would willfully act to destroy the full faith and credit of the United States unless the Congress acquiesces to all of his demands, at least as long as he sees political advantage in doing so. His every statement and action is consistent with this conclusion. If the Republicans acquiesce, the immediate crisis will quickly vanish. Credit markets will calm and public life will return to other matters. But a fundamental element of our Constitution will have been destroyed. The power of the purse will have shifted from the representatives of the people to the executive. The executive bureaucracies will be freed to churn out ever more outlandish regulations with no effective congressional review or check through the purse. A perilous era will have begun in which the president sets spending levels and vetoes any bill falling short of his demands. Whenever a deadline approaches, one house can simply refuse to negotiate with the other until Congress is faced with the Hobson's choice of a shutdown or a default. The nation's spending will again dangerously accelerate. The deficit will again rapidly widen. And the economic prosperity of the nation will continue to slowly bleed away. This impasse may have started as a dispute over a collapsing health program, but it has now taken on the dimensions of a constitutional crisis. Yesterday in Washington, a group of American veterans rose up to take a stand against these constitutional usurpations. 
I believe the salvation of our nation now depends on the American people joining them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is perhaps the most astute observation and the most clear distinguishing speech we had heard during the entire debacle related to debt. This is an alert. It's a warning that the nation is falling into a, a, a fascist dictatorship, at least financially, if nothing else. And remember that with that kind of financing capability, a blank check, essentially, there is no limitation on what the president can do in terms of his expanding of federal government, his expanding of big government. And there is no limit to the amount of spending that the president can incur to subjugate and enslave the, own, the, the subjects themselves, not the citizens, because they no longer consider us to be those. I want you to listen to this, and this is Representative Tom McClintock. He's a Republican from California, 4th District. This is a recording off of a C-SPAN from uh, October 14th. Extraordinarily valuable, insightful speech. I want you to listen to it. I want you to hear it. Get a printout of it. There's a link on our website. It's off of Real Clear Politics. If you can't find it any other way, just type in uh, McClintock, power to raise debt limit shifted from Congress to president. Okay, stick with me. Hang on and listen to this. It's very important. Mr. Speaker, the debt limit exists for a simple reason to assure that public debt isn't recklessly piled up without Congress periodically acknowledging it and addressing the spending patterns that are causing it. <clears throat> if the debt limit increase is supposed to be automatic, as the President suggests, then there's really no purpose to it. Now, a new dimension has now appeared in this discussion. Unlike every one of his predecessors, this President has vowed that unless Congress unconditionally raises the debt limit, the United States will default on its sovereign debt. But a failure to raise the debt limit would not by itself cause the nation to default. The Government Accountability Office has consistently held that the Treasury Secretary has, quote, the authority to choose the order in which to pay obligations of the United States and to protect the nation's credit. Such authority is inherent in the 1789 Act that established the Treasury Department and entrusted it with, quote, the management of the revenue and, quote, the support of the public credit. The affirmative duty of the Treasury Department to do so is underscored by the 14th Amendment. Our revenues are more than 10 times our debt payments, so paying the debt first to prevent a sovereign default is well within the financial ability of the federal government. Indeed, it is a fiscal imperative. Now, earlier this year, the House passed H.R. 807, which not only explicitly requires the payment of the national debt in the case of an impasse over the debt limit, but even allows the President to exceed the debt limit itself in order to protect the nation's credit. That measure languishes in the Senate under the threat of a presidential veto. Remember what he's saying, or hear, hear what he's saying here, that they gave the, cap the capability to the President to exceed the debt limit itself just under the guise of the nation's credit. In other words, if the government still shut down and the impasse was, was untenable, that the president could exceed the debt limit, but only for the purposes of meeting the, the, national, uh, the national requirement to pay their obligations. And so all of the, all of the, the rhetoric notwithstanding, the president gave us the, the, the situation that you know this was a do-or-die situation, which it was not at all. In other words, earlier this year, the House said it's never a do or die situation. We're going to give you the capability to pay the debt limit, even if government gets to a point where it's no longer you know, able to, to work under a shutdown scenario. And the president has refused to sign it. And Harry Reid has refused to put it up onto the Senate floor for a vote. Ladies and gentlemen, what that tells you is that Harry Reid is the most obstructionist individual that is currently in government today. With his say-so, any law, any regulation, any new rule can be blocked. Harry Reid is, at this stage in the game, acting almost in the position of a president himself. 
Protecting the sovereign credit by prioritizing payments would mean delaying paying other bills. That is also untenable, unthinkable, and something much to be avoided. But it would not imperil the nation's sovereign credit. Only the president can do that. Bingo. The House leadership... <clears throat> Uh, met with the president last week and offered to extend the debt limit until November 22nd with no strings attached. The president refused. Senate Republicans offered a six-month extension, but the Senate Democratic leader refused. What the president threatens to do would be catastrophic and unprecedented. The full faith and credit of the United States is what gives markets the confidence to loan money to the federal government. Even a threat of default, exactly the kind the president is now making, could have dire consequences to a nation that now owes more than its entire economy produces in a year. So where do we go from here? Republicans have miscalculated on two key assumptions. First, that the Democrats would negotiate the issues that divide our country. They have not. Second, that Democrats would seek to minimize the suffering caused by the impasse. They have not. Given the ruthless and vindictive way the shutdown has been handled, I now believe that this president would willfully act to destroy the full faith and credit of the United States unless the Congress acquiesces to all of his demands, at least as long as he sees political advantage in doing so. Did you hear that statement? Did you listen to what he just said? He was very clear about his, about his belief that the executive, or the president in this case, and here's what he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to characterize it again. Given the ruthless and vindictive way the shutdown has been handled, I now believe that this president would willfully act to destroy the full faith and credit of the United States unless the Congress acquiesces to all of his demands at least as long as he sees political advantage in doing so. His every statement and action is consistent with this conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a scorched earth mentality with this president. In other words, he is willing to destroy the United States of America if we do not bend to his dictatorial demands. We have reached a point in time in which the nation is no longer under civilian control. Mark my words, we are no longer under civilian control. The United States has now become a financial predominantly, but in addition to that, a military dictatorship. And Obama is at the head. If the Republicans acquiesce, the immediate crisis will quickly vanish, credit markets will calm, and public life will return to other matters. But a fundamental element of our Constitution will have been destroyed. The power of the purse will have shifted from the representatives of the people to the executive. The executive bureaucracies will be freed to churn out ever more outlandish regulations with no effective congressional review or check through the purse. A perilous era will have begun in which the president sets spending levels and vetoes any bill falling short of his demands. Whenever a deadline approaches, one house can simply refuse to negotiate with the other until Congress is faced with the Hobson's choice of a shutdown or a default. The nation's spending will again dangerously accelerate, the deficit will rapidly widen, and the economic prosperity of the nation will continue to slowly bleed away. This impasse may have started as a dispute over a collapsing health program, but it's now taken on the dimensions of a constitutional crisis. Yesterday in Washington, a group of America's veterans rose up to take a stand against these unconstitutional usurpations. I believe the salvation of our nation now ultimately depends on the American people joining them. I yield back. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a representative of the House speaking candidly, clearly, and telling you everything that you need to know. It was a public statement that we have now entered a de facto dictatorship 
in the United States of America. This issue of the debt limit and how um, this president can hold the nation hostage. You know, I'm reminded in this case of, you know, a, a scene from a movie where, you know, a, a criminal has a guy's wife at gunpoint and says, if you move, I'm going to kill her. And the guy looks at him and says, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, the truth is that this president has taken our nation to the brink of a world cataclysm of the financial markets to force this nation to its knees in favor of his demands. This is a dangerous, dangerous precedent, and not one which will, at any, at any time in the future, disappear. You watch what happens in February as this whole debt limit thing comes back up again. And by the way, for the record, we didn't raise the debt limit between now and February. We just said that we're not going to enforce it. So there is nothing prohibiting or barring this president from borrowing, for all intents and purposes, a trillion dollars between now and February, and then demanding in February another trillion or five trillion. It makes no difference. We are now in a police state dictatorship with Obama as the head. You may not believe me now. You may say, this guy is wearing a tinfoil hat. I cannot believe what he's saying. But I promise you, over a relatively short period of time of history, you will look back at this window, you will look back at this time, and you will say, that's when it happened. That's when the United States went from a republic to an authoritarian, totalitarian dictatorship. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about preparedness and what you can do to set up yourself and your family in a position where you have the capability to withstand short-term and even moderate, not long-term, but moderate-term crises, whether they be natural disasters, whether they be man-made, whether they be civil unrest, whatever it is, I want you to understand what's, what the importance is of being prepared. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about that. Find us on the web at americasvoicenow.org, youtube.com forward slash americasvoicenow, and facebook.com forward slash americasvoicenow. You can find a link to this video on our website and on our, um, our uh, Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Make sure that you watch this today and mark this down. This is a turning moment in the United States.